Hey, good morning. We're looking at uh, different subjects as uh, we're going through this Why series. And there was a question that was brought up on Wednesday night. We have a question and answer period before the study. And one of the questions was about the rapture. So I thought this morning, um, I'm going to speak on why the rapture instead of wrath for the church. Uh, why is the rapture and not the wrath? Uh, there are two major doctrines concerning that. I'm not going to elaborate on the extent of those doctrines or where they, uh, why they are the way they are so much as just what the scripture says concerning these things. Um, the early church taught in the hope of the rapture. The early church taught in the idea that uh, the coming of the Lord, the blessed hope, the assurance of that, was uh, a driving force for them in going through many difficult times and trials to look forward to the Lord catching them up to be with the Lord and their relationship of if they die, they go to be with the Lord and they're, they're with him uh, instantly. But to, if so much so that in Thessalonians, he talked about not being concerned if they've missed the rapture because there's indications of what would happen that they would know that uh, they, if they're believers, they would have been caught up to be with the Lord or they would have died and they would have been with the Lord and not to feel like they've missed it. But then what happened was the, uh, the church became uh, amalgamated into the society, as you know, in the 300 ADs of uh, what's called the Catholic Church or was the concept of a universal church, but it was as much of a political entity as well as a religious entity, and therefore uh, part of it was the works, that your justification became more and more by your works and their dominance in the world to bring about the uh, return of the Lord, that uh, as time went on became more and more evident that it was about the control of the church in relationship to the world around them to bring the advent of the return of Jesus Christ uh, Reformation didn't change the eschatology much except for we're saved by grace through faith, not of works, least anyone should boast, uh, became a, a major part of the teaching. And of course, then the word of God was open for more and more people with printing and everything else to be in the hands of the individuals to know that their walk uh, was justified by their faith and not by their works. And so... Uh, but both, in, when it comes to eschatology, had left out what was originally there, and that was the looking for the uh, rapture, to being caught up to, be, to meet the Lord in the air, and so would we ever be with the Lord. Uh, but in the late 1800s, when the Jews started going back to uh, Israel, and uh, were looking for their homeland, for what's called the Zionist movement, and then later on, of course, Israel actually becoming a nation in a day. During that process of time, because of the, the overwhelming evidence of the fulfillment of that prophecy concerning Israel, I think it opened the door for an eschatology for the people to realize that the Bible had a lot to say from the very foundation of the word concerning the blessed hope. And so there became a renewal in the study of eschatology, of looking at it not as uh, we're already in the millennium and we're just waiting for the return of the Lord and the, the, the better we are as a church and the more aggressive we are in politics and everything else eventually will bring about the second coming of Christ. But realizing, wait a minute, the scriptures talk about something else and going back to where the, the, the scriptures were, mainly because now so many people have them and could study it and actually question the, the religious leaders and the organizations. And say, well, what about this verse? What about that? And so uh, Pastor Chuck Smith and uh, uh, the Schofield Bible, of course, and other uh, great teachers were looking at very seriously what does the Bible say when it comes to uh, this issue of the rapture of the believers. And so... Uh, you have two viewpoints. One is post-trib and the other is pre-trib. Pre-trib meaning you're looking at being caught up to be with the Lord before tribulation. Post-trib is 
after tribulation. It used to be that they just thought, post-trib, was that uh, it was all one event because they didn't believe in the rapture, but it, it's so conclusive in the Bible that they finally resolved, okay, the rapture's gonna happen, but it'll be at the end uh, with tribulation. So tribulation's over, you're caught up to meet the Lord in the air, and then you come right back down at the end of tribulation. It's all kind of a simultaneous thing. I don't know the point of all that, but anyway, that's the, the part of the uh, belief, and that they are the 144,000, the church is, not Israel. That their spiritual Israel, a lot of other things. But what I want to deal with this morning is just what do the scriptures say? I don't want all the dogmas and doctrines and all the rest of the stuff, but just look at the scripture and you decide and see what these things are about. One of the things I love about the pre-tribulation, because I've studied uh, both for some extensive time, is the pre-trib is the only one you can just hand, hand a brand new believer the Bible and say, read it and believe it. You don't really need to have somebody interpret every aspect of it to understand what it says when it comes to these events. Just read it. And that's what I want to do this morning is look at those issues. So God grant us wisdom and understanding as, as we do that. So we'll, we'll begin with uh, Revelation chapter 3, verse 10, because there are seven churches that Jesus Christ writes letters to. And the last one is Laodicea, and it's the last church age, though all the churches exist at the same time during the time it was written. And over a period of time, each one of these churches represented the majority of the age, until you finally get to this last age where all of them exist, but the one that's predominant is Laodicea. And they are the mega church, and not that mega churches are bad, but in the sense of there, there's a whole group of them that are mega church around the world, and that are just, uh, politically driven to bring about the second coming, correct all the maladies and the faults and, and moralize everything. And what you have is, you know, some evidence of some good things, but no changed hearts. Knowledge about Jesus, but not Jesus. And um, so they say, well, we're, and they have all the funding they need. And they say, well, we're rich and have need of nothing. Obviously, God's on our side. But they leave out the blood atonement. They leave out uh, the real the fullness of the Spirit of God in their life, the relationship with Jesus Christ, uh, and in many cases, the issues of the rapture of the church and some other things. But the biggest thing that they leave out that's evident in the Laodicean church is the issue of sin. That they, they look and they say, well, this sin, you know, we're in the 21st century, so this is, this is different now, and this is different now. And, and they just either don't talk about it or, you know, they're not gonna answer the questions to Oprah or anybody else about it. They avoid those things. And Jesus' response is pretty simple. He says, you make me sick and I'm going to vomit you out of my mouth. Uh, but there's another church that I believe is a part of, they're all part of the last age, all seven churches, but that is a, has been the predominant church for some time and is becoming less and less, unfortunately, as, because we're coming into that final age. Uh, but it's the church of Philadelphia. And it's a church that he says, well, uh, you're... Um, not much in far as power and, uh, you know, you don't have uh, a lot of strength, but I've opened doors for you that no one can close and I've closed doors that, you know, you're, you're not going to go through. And he says in Revelation chapter 3, verse 10 to that church, and I believe that, that every Bible teaching, fundamentally Bible teaching, stick to the word of God church uh, is part of that movement that is evangelical that does reach out beyond their own borders and and uh, you know mission works and stuff but he says you have little strength so it's not a powerful political entity or something like that he says but i'll keep you from the hour of trial or tribulation that will come upon the whole earth it's very specific he didn't say it's going to come upon jerusalem or just the Middle East. It's just like saying the flood was local. It wasn't worldwide, you know. It's very specific. It's the whole world. Now, in John 16, 33, it says that there are personal tribulations you go through. In this world, you'll have tribulation. So the word itself has to have a context. In this world, you'll have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I've overcome the world. So personally, we all have tribulations to one degree or another, some worse than others, some depending on where they grow up, 
where, where they live, what the culture is, what the age is, all that stuff. It's, but it's personal. And uh, we deal with it between us and the Lord and growing and maturing in the test of our faith. Then there is those that are regional, like in Revelation chapter 2, verse 8. And that is like Smyrna. And we've got the, the church of Smyrna today in North Korea and in parts of China and other places where it is in Cambodia and other places. It is the suffering church. And they're there today. They're the church of Smyrna. So you have the church that, is, uh, that's, that goes through a regional tribulation. You have the personal tribulation. But then there's the tribulation that's for the whole world called the day of God's wrath. In Revelation chapter 6, verse 17, it's literally the day of wrath. And it refers to the verse before it in verse 16, the wrath of the Lamb. Now, he is the lion of the tribe of Judah, but ironically, it calls it the wrath of the Lamb because it's in the whole metaphor saying, this is the one who sacrificed his life if anybody has got a right to wrath for the unbelievers. It's the one that gave his life. And so it's the wrath of of the lamb and it means again for what part of the world the whole world so this is a big deal um, in the relationship that we have with the lord then are you going to go through this judgment that's what it is this wrath that will fall upon the whole world in first thessalonians 5 9 5 9 says you are not appointed set forth appointed for wrath you're the bride of christ you're not set appointed to come under the wrath of almighty god do you have trials yes do you have tribulations do you have testings yes. but the wrath of god no in romans chapter 5 verse 9 ironically romans 5 9 if you go to chapter 5, verse 9 in Romans, it says, much more than having now been justified by his blood, if you've been justified by his blood, in other words, our blood is filled with sin, his blood is pure. If you've been transfused by being born again, you've received Christ in his life, you have been justified by his blood, his sacrifice. It says, we shall be saved then, where? From the wrath of through him not save for wrath to be victorious and say to the mountain be removed and cast into the sea but save from wrath we will not be there and uh, we're not appointed to wrath in both cases it's very specific now uh, where does all this come from uh, there's several scriptures and we don't have time for all of them but the, probably the main key one in the Old Testament comes from Daniel and we'll see that when we look in Luke but because uh, Jesus quotes it but in Daniel chapter 9 it speaks of 70 weeks of the whole eternal destiny of earth and he comes down to the 70 week period the 69 weeks of years uh, the word weeks literally is like we'd say dozens if I said a dozen how many am I saying if you said weeks how many would I be saying Seven, yeah. So they use that term like we use dozens. So it would be weeks and uh, uh, um, could be, you know, seven chickens or it could be seven years. It depends on the context, okay? Um, so the first part of it, uh, without going into, too, you know, the, there's books and books written on how to break this down. The Coming Prince is probably the best one you could read. But... Um, we did such a thorough job uh, uh, with the understanding of it. But the, f the first part of the 69 weeks of years would be uh, 173,880 days to the day that Artaxerxes gave the commandment to go forth and rebuild the temple. And so to the day that that happened, to the day that Christ came in, according to Zechariah and the colt, the foal of a donkey, to that day, uh, they cried out, Hosanna. That's why Jesus said, if they didn't cry out, the rocks would cry out. And because uh, it fulfilled the prophecy very precisely of the coming of the Lord, where they would say, save now, and he would be welcomed into Jerusalem. Then it talks about the sacrifice of Christ and, and everything that's there. Then you get into the 70th week, which would be seven years. And in the middle of that is a three and a half year period where you have the Antichrist 
put into power, and we'll see other scriptures concerning it, this is just an overview, uh, would be brought into power, and in that place of power, they would build the temple, but he would do what Antiochus Epiphanes did, he would offer up a defamed sacrifice, a pig or something like that on the altar, defile it, Israel's told to run and hide and get out of there when that happens. And um, the point of it is, you've got seven years, peace, peace when there is no peace, uh, the peacemaker, the Antichrist, is uh, hailed by the people of the world that he's going to bring this world government no one can buy or sell without the mark of the beast and all of this. And then in the false prophet, you get to three and a half years, the temple's built. He desecrates it at that point that he desecrates it. Three and a half years later is the coming of Christ. So we know when the second coming happens. We know the time frame. What we don't know is when the rapture happens. But once tribulation happens, they know they've got seven years left, and that's it. Now, uh, in Matthew 24, it gives us a description. And what I'm uh, attempting to do here without going into all the scriptures is taking the key scriptures that, that give us this thread from the Old Testament through the New of the events that happened with the rapture in relationship to the church and the tribulation in relationship to the world and to Israel. So in, in uh, Matthew chapter 24, which is really a key scripture in the New Testament, is equal to Daniel, uh, I think in the Old, in Matthew 24, uh, it says, Then Jesus went out, in verse 1, and departed from the temple. His disciples came up to show him the building of the temple, this huge building, of course, and Jesus said to them, Do you not see all these things? Assuredly, I say to you, not one stone shall be left here upon another that shall not be thrown down. And under um, uh, Titus in 70 AD, that's exactly what happened. Every stone was torn down. That must have just been so stirring in their hearts when it happened, besides the many people that were killed by, by Titus. But that that scripture was fulfilled, wouldn't that make you... Look at all of the other prophecies that you might have just kind of thrown in the back and, you know, I'm following Jesus and he died. That was a shock. Now he rose from the dead. And they say, wow, this is fantastic. And then the temple in 70 AD is destroyed. Like, what else did he say? I mean, it would, it would stir your heart and mind to think. I think everything that we find Paul writing about has to do with what Jesus said or what already came out of the Old Testament. He didn't just make the stuff up. It all related to what the Lord said about the Old Testament or said prophetically or what was already said and Paul brought it into Thessalonians, Corinthians. Uh, we see it fulfilled in Revelation. It all has that biblical foundation. So he tells them, uh, he says, now as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, tell us when will these things be? When's this gonna happen? What shall be the sign of your coming? Well, how will we know this? And what about the end of the age? Jesus answered and said to them, Take heed that no one deceives you, for many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will deceive many. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars, and see that you are not troubled, for all these things must come to pass. The end is not yet. So when you talk about the end of the age, he's talking about these things, obviously to them as disciples, to Israel uh, and you'll see further on why, but this is to the nation of Israel. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines and pestilence and earthquakes in various places, and these are the beginnings of sorrows. And so we see that even more and more as, uh, in the last 50, 50 years, of uh, 100 years, of wars that are worldwide and local wars and... and, and um, uh, just so many nations that split and become two nations and battles constantly now. He says, you're going to hear about a lot of that. It's going to get worse. <clears throat> then they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you. They must have taken note of that, I think. Um, and you will be hated by all nations for my namesake. One of the events of the end times is all nations will hate Israel. Oh, all. Now, you think, oh, come on, can that happen? Well, it's happening. In fact, it's been happening right under our nose, and we didn't even know it until recently when President Trump 
uh, bought us some things about the Palestinians and the Congress checked into it and guess what? We're financing the Palestinian Liberation Army for $300 million a year uh, along with other nations that are doing it because they have no real income of their own, no nation. And um, <laughs> do you know what they do with that money? They pay the survivors of those that are terrorists. So if a terrorist dies, they're a martyr, their family is taken care of for life. If they live through it, they are taken care of for life. All the medical expenses, their clothing, a stipends, and their family is also taken care of for life with your money, $300 million a year, and we've been doing it for decades. And it is totally a slaughter. And, it's, and the reason why Palestinian government does it, to kill nobody else, what they're after, babies or adults, doesn't matter to them, Jews. And we pay for it. All nations, right now we're one of the few that take a stand constantly in the United Nations to strengthen Israel. And then many will be uh, offended and betray one another and will hate one another. And many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. No matter what the politics of any part of the world want, they're always going to be facing the religious heart of man the desire to have spiritual leadership. And too much of it is a counterfeit, but it doesn't mean the real thing isn't there. So he's saying, guard yourself, that many false prophets will rise up and deceive many, and because the lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. But he who endures to the end shall be saved. And there'll be those that go from tribulation right into the millennium and uh, don't necessarily know the Lord, will raise families in there and have an opportunity to get saved in the process. But, and this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations, and then the end will come. Revelation says the angels of heaven will actually do that preaching. But there are those that say, no, we're, as we go into all the world, we preach the gospel, we're going to make that happen. Well, we're to do it, obviously, but I, you'll see in a minute the scriptures that say, but we're not going to make it happen. Does it mean we shouldn't do it? No. But the point is, God's sovereignty for the last days is his sovereignty. Not even the son knows when the rapture takes place. He knows when he's coming back the second time. But even that, and there's a reason for that, for him not to know. So here he explains it this way in 15. Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place, whoever reads, let him understand. Can you imagine being a Jew especially, during tribulation, the church is gone. You're thinking, that guy that was sharing with me, that woman that was sharing with me at work about, you know, the rapture and all that, and now all of a sudden all these people are gone, there's chaos and people don't know what's going on. And here in Matthew it says, the, read Daniel the prophet, whoever reads, let him understand. In other words, pay attention. <laughs> this is for you. I mean, I just imagine what that would do to you. Realize, wow, he's talking to me. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains which, you know, they need to get out of there because if the tribulation is going to take place, they'll be slaughtered. Let him who, uh, who is in the housetop not go down to take, another, uh, take anything out of the house. Let him who is in the field not go back to get his clothes. And woe to those who are pregnant and those who are nursing uh, babies in those days and pray that your flight may not be in winter or on the Sabbath. For then there will be great tribulation such as, in case there's any doubt that it's about the same thing in, in Revelation, such as has not been since the beginning of the world until this time, no, nor shall ever be. Pretty bad. And unless those days were shortened, no flesh would be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days will be shortened. That's the day of Armageddon, the battle of Armageddon. Jesus is going to stop it uh, before it goes too far. Everybody would be killed. Then if anyone says to you, look, here's Christ or there, do not believe it. For false Christs and false prophets will rise and show great signs and wonders to deceive all possible, uh, to deceive, if possible, even the elect. So um, there will be many deceivers. He says, don't follow them. Christ has already risen, in other words. And uh, we find out later on, of course, what happens there. But he's saying, don't follow them. And the reason is he's in heaven, he sends his Holy Spirit. Say, I've told you beforehand. Therefore, 
If they say to you, look, here is in the desert, do not go out, or look, he is in the inner rooms, do not believe it. For as the lightning comes from the east and flashes to the west, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. That's the second coming. We'll see later. The mystery of the coming of the Lord for us is hidden, the rapture, to be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. But the second coming, three and a half years after tribulation, can be from the, the, the east to the west. The sky will light up. Everybody will know that the Lord has returned. And then he gives an odd example, but it's still nonetheless what he's given. And wherever the carcass is, there the eagles will be gathered together. In other words, uh, if you saw a carcass, you'd know in the, out in the wilderness there's eagles are going to be there. If you saw the eagles, you could find the carcass. In other words, the second coming, if you're standing there and you see him, you know, the evidence of that being Christ and not a deceiver is lightning from the east to the west. If you see the lightning, you can look for the Lord because he's come back. It's going to be that extensive. The whole planet will light up and you go, the Lord's return. It's three and a half years. It all makes sense. In other words, one will justify the other, or explain the other in that sense. Now, um, in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, to find the context of what's happening at this event, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, when it comes to tribulation. It says, now, brethren, verse 1, 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 1, now, brethren, and if you haven't started yet, I'd encourage you to get a piece of paper, write down the scripture so you can go back and see them all in context and everything else uh, later on, but concerning the, con the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him. There's the coming of the Lord. There's also the gathering together where we're going to meet the Lord in the air. Do not be soon shaken in mind or troubled, either by spirit or by word or by letter, as if uh, from us, as though the day of Christ had come. They were so looking for it. And then there were probably those that were saying, oh, he's already come back. We missed him. He's going, no, don't, don't believe that. Uh, the second coming, everybody will know. But there's evi other evidence about the things that will happen that you need to understand how this takes place. Let no one deceive you for, by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition. There will be a great apostasy. And I believe that apostasy is part of that church, which is uh, the Laodicean carryover right into tribulation where they say, oh, we got it together. We're, we're politically connected. We're, we're rich and we have need of nothing. And, and it's an apostasy. And he says, you make me sick. He says, who opposes and explains himself above and exalts himself rather above all that is called God or that is worshiped so that he sits as God in the temple. We know the temple is going to be built in, the, uh, in Jerusalem uh, in these days, showing himself that he is God. Do not do you not remember that when I was with you, I told you these things? And now you know what is restraining, that he may be revealed in his own time. So something is restraining. I believe that to be the church because of the scriptures he gave us in First Thessalonians. And that's why he says, don't you know I already told you this? So we go to First Thessalonians and we'll find out what he said. But he says, for the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. That's the body of Christ. And when the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming, that's the second coming after we're taken out of the way. The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders and with all unrighteousness, deception among those who perish because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. For this reason, God will send them strong delusion that they should believe the lie and that they may be condemned who did not believe the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Just like with Pharaoh, he kept hardening in his heart. He said, okay, that's it, I'm done, and hardened his heart. And so there's a point at which those that don't want to believe, and then they see the rapture, and he says, you didn't want to believe the truth? Now I'm going to give you a lie. I'm going to turn you over to it. You can have it. You want to, you want to live that way? You want to have that? Then here, it's yours, and they'll be right in the thick of tribulation because of it. Now, uh, before the tribulation, 
where does Paul get the idea of what's going to happen? Because in you, if you go to 1 Thessalonians, because Paul said, didn't I already talk to you about this? So we'll back up to 1 Thessalonians and we see what is restraining, what's, ta- what's taken out of the way. In chapter 4 of 1 Thessalonians, verse 1, Finally, then, brethren, we urge and exhort in the Lord Jesus that you should abound more and more just as you have received from us how you ought to walk and to please God. For you know what commandments we gave uh, you through the Lord Jesus. For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you should abstain from sexual immorality, uh, that each of you should know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor. Of course, that was way back then. We don't have to worry about that now, right? (laughs) Not in passion of lust or like the Gentiles who do not know God, that no one should take advantage of and defraud his brother in this manner because the Lord is the avenger of all such as we also forewarned you and testified for God did not call us to uncleanness but to holiness. The reason I'm reading this before the next part is because even though we look for the return of the Lord, we look for the rapture, that doesn't mean that we just do whatever because the Lord's coming back. He's saying you live a sanctified life, not because you're going to make the Lord come back sooner, but because it's your personal growth in the Lord in relationship for the rewards, both here and in heaven, that that you want to have that um, uh, commitment. Therefore, he who rejects this does not reject man, but God who has also given us his Holy Spirit. But concerning brotherly love, you have no need that I should write to you, for you yourselves are taught by God to love one another, and indeed you do do so toward all the brethren who are in Macedonia. But we urge you, brethren, that you increase more and more, that you also aspire to lead a quiet life, to mind your own business, and to work with your own hands as we commanded you, that you may walk properly toward those who are outside. So you can be a witness to the people around you, live your life properly, in other words, and that you may, and then you, you're going to lack nothing. Then he says, but saying all of that, how you should live your life, he says, I don't want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, a Christian term for death. Since death had, doesn't have a sting, they use the term sleep. Um, had fallen asleep, least you sorrow as others who have no hope. People will whose friends die and uh, they don't know Christ. It's, it, it's a hopeless despair. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. You have relatives that have died and gone to be with the Lord. God's going to bring them back for you to meet them in the air. For this, is, this we say to you, and he tells us how it's going to happen now, by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. So we're not going to go before them, go up and, and, and be with the Lord, and then those that have already died are waiting. He said, no, you, you, so he's talking about the rapture. You're not going to precede them. They're already there. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, the voice of an archangel and with the trumpet of God and the dead in Christ will rise first. They've already risen, in other words, and if somebody dies now and then we're raptured now, the dead have risen first. We're not going to precede them no matter what. The dead rise first. Um, Then we who are alive and remain, all of us alive, if you're asleep, wake up. (laughs) Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up. The word caught up in the Latin, that's the concept of rapture. We don't find that in the English. It's a Latin word, but we use it to explain caught up. So that's what it means, to be caught up, to be caught up to heaven. Shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus, so we're going to meet them and the Lord in the air. We shall always be with the Lord. Obviously different than the second coming where we c- he comes down with the saints and plants his feet in the... In the uh, the Battle of Armageddon in the whole thing in the Mount of Olives and stops it all. This is something different. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, worry about it till you get to tribute. Oh no, therefore comfort one another with these words. It's to bring us comfort. And um, 
Now, where does he come up with this stuff? Paul didn't just have revelations from God, though he did, but he knew the scriptures. And even as Jesus, who obviously knew the scriptures and could speak of future prophetic things, uh, which Paul did, but he referred always as his foundation to the Old Testament. And so when uh, we see scriptures that Paul writes about the second coming or any of the other things that are there, I always think, well, where did he get that? And, I, and I'm sure there's other places, but here's an example I think that speaks to this specifically. Isaiah chapter 26. He begins in Isaiah chapter 26 with the idea of how we live our life. And he says that, you'll, uh, that w- if we walk with the Lord as a righteous nation, uh, that will keep us in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on him. Uh, verse 7, the way of the just is, up, is uprightness. Um, in verse 9, he talks about, uh, yes, by my spirit within me, I will seek you early, for when your judgments are in the earth, the inhabitants of the world and will... Uh, will learn righteousness. So he said, let, uh, let grace be shown, verse 10, to the wicked, yet he will not learn righteousness. In the land of uprightness, he will deal unjustly. So he's saying, show grace to them anyway. God is, is not going to hold anything back, but he says, I already know. They're not going to receive it. And then he explains why and what's happening here. Um, When we get to verse 16, he says, Lord, in trouble they have visited you. They poured out a prayer uh, when your chastening was upon them. And as a woman with child, and you'll notice that's something Paul talked about, uh, the travail of birth and everything else in relationship. And he talks about himself feeling like a a, a woman travailing in birth to try to uh, bring the the church to full maturity and all of that. He says, as a woman with child in pain cries out in her pangs, he says, when she draws near the time of her delivery, so have we been in your sight, O Lord. We've been like a woman giving birth. We have been with child. We have been in pain. We have, as it were, brought forth wind. You know, what? Because he's saying, with all of our efforts, we haven't changed the world. We've changed individuals. People get saved. People have been getting saved by the millions every year, and that that is going much faster now than ever before. Thank God. All over the world, phenomenal reports of salvations. But does that change the sin in the world? No, it changes sin in the sinner. But the world continues, and that's what he's talking about. That doesn't, what we do, though we're to do it to reach individuals, isn't going to change a dictatorial authority, a government, a, uh, you know, uh, a system that is run by the devil himself because he's the prince in the power of the air. So he says, this is how he's, he's explaining it. He says, but we brought forth wind. We have not accomplished any deliverance in the earth nor have we have the inhabitants of the world fallen. And then he explains it. This should sound familiar. The dead shall live. Together with my dead body, they shall arise. Awake and sing, you who dwell in the dust, for your dew is like the dew of the herbs, and the earth shall cast out the dead. Which is just exactly what he said in Thessalonians. Now, he says something here that ties it all together. They had a traditional Jewish wedding. I don't know if they knew it was traditional then, but it is now. Anyway, it was, it was how they did their weddings. And the father would pick the groom for the bride. She could say yes or no, but uh, if she said yes, they were engaged, like Joseph and Mary. The engagement was as good as marriage. In fact, to separate from an engagement, it would be a formal divorce, a public divorce. So he picks uh, the bride for the groom, rather, and the agreement is made, and then this is what happens. The groom then is told by the father, you build a house, and I'll tell you when it's ready. 
So Jesus said, Behold, I go and prepare a place for you that where I am, you shall be also. In my Father's house are many mansions. And so they take the Father's house, and next to it or behind it, he'd build another house. And he would build it for his bride. And is it ready? Is it ready? And the Father goes, Eh, no, you, you, you need some drapes over here. That's not going to work, you know. But anyway, he, he's building constantly. The bride, on the other hand, every night would put on her righteous wedding garment that depicted her relation of living righteously, waiting for her groom, and waited for the day of elopement, surprised the rapture to be caught up by him. When the father would say, it's time, go get your bride, he would gather all of his friends and they would go out, remember, no lights, go out in the streets, the virgins would come out in celebration of what was happening and they would take their lanterns and light them. They would, uh, they, uh, the, the brothers, the friends of his would then blow the trumpet and he had this couch, talks about a Song of Solomon and they would carry it on their shoulders and they'd go to the house and they'd go inside. The parents knew what was going on, but they'd go inside and they'd elope. They would take her away, put her on the couch, and everybody would celebrate. They would go back to the father's house or like with Abraham, Isaac, and, and uh, Isaac had the tent. Remember his father's tent? Well, it's the same picture there. They would go into the tent and all the provisions were there for seven days. And at the end of seven days, she would come out, the veil is then lifted, and they'd go, that's the bride. And so the veil is lifted after tribulation. And people go, you're a believer. <laughs> that's the bride. Now listen to what he says. Come, my people, and enter your chambers. They understood what all this meant. And shut your doors behind you. Hide yourself, as it were, for a little moment until the indignation, the tribulation, is past. For behold, the Lord comes out of his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth for their iniquity. The earth also will disclose her blood and will no more cover her slain. So what happens is the marriage supper of the Lamb takes place. And the rewards are given, celebration. We don't see what's going on, I believe, at all as far as the tribulation. We don't see people that are left that we love, that we care about, that refuse the gospel. We just, it's a marriage supper of the Lamb and there's rewards and, and blessings and everything else. And then when it's done, he says, okay, let's rise, get on the horses, we're going back. And we go back with him, not with swords. He's the only one with a sword. Revelation chapter 20, 1920. He, he goes back with the sword. We ride with him, but he ends it all with the word, out, with the word of God from his mouth as a two-edged sword. So it's not a fight for us. He just takes care of business. Now, there's symbolism besides what we just saw here in Isaiah, which is very specific, I think, concerning what he wrote, but also what, um, uh, what we find in the scriptures. In um, uh, Genesis 19, Lot was taken out of Sodom and Gomorrah before the judgment. In fact, 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 7 through 9 calls that righteous man Lot who is f whose, whose spirit was vexed morning and night. So he's going through all of these things, but he's in a place where he doesn't want to be, but he's there, and all of these terrible things happen, and then the Lord sends the angels and says, get him out of there, because judgment's coming. And he protects him and his family, saves them. Uh, in um, Enoch was not for God took him, Genesis chapter 5, verse 24. When did he take him? Before the flood. Methuselah and others that were believers have already died. What's left is, is uh, other people that are there, but they're not believers. And Enoch was taken, was raptured, caught up because he walked with God. And then you have Noah taken in and surviving through the tribulation, a type of Israel through the flood. Now, as I said, Paul speaks about the Old Testament using examples. So does Jesus Christ. That's where I want to take a final look. And that's in uh, Luke chapter 17. Luke chapter 17. In verse 20, 
says, when he asked the Pharisees of Luke 17, the kingdom of God, when the kingdom of God would come, the Pharisees asked, he answered them and said, the kingdom of God does not come with observation. In other words, not because you're watching for it. Oh, gee, they're looking for the kingdom. It's going to happen. It, it's not going to be something you see that way. Nor will they say, it's like watching a pot boil, I think, sometimes. It says, nor will they say, see here or see there, for indeed the kingdom of God is where? Within you. In other words, when you're saved, the kingdom of God, his spirit comes in you. You are seated in heavenly places. So live like a child of the king. Live like the bride of Christ. Live like the servant of God. The spirit, the kingdom of God is within you already. You will go into the kingdom, but live like it now because the kingdom is in you. And so he's again saying, occupy till I come. Just live it out, waiting for that day that's final, but until then, live like one who's already in the kingdom because the kingdom's in you. And then he said to his disciples, these days will come when you desire to see one, um, uh, to see one of the days of the, of the uh, Son of Man and you will not see it. And they will say to you, look here, look there, do not go after them or follow them. For as the lightning that flashes out of one part under heaven shines to the other part under heaven, so also the Son of Man will be in his day. That's the second coming, right? But first, he must suffer many things and be rejected by his generation. And sometimes it gets a little confusing because he says this and then he says that. He says something and then he says, but let's take a look at this. It'd be kind of like if, if you've had several kids and you kind of know what's going on. And so you have this child, and you're like, oh, look at it, a young kid and anything else. And you say, yep, this child, you already know what the other ones are doing. This one's going to school, this one's this and this. And this. this child's going to run the company, the family business. This child is going to run the family business, and this child is going to uh, build a plant in England, and, and you're going, he's only six months old. But you already know he's going to do that. And then after that, and you say, but first, he is going to go through business school. He is going to have some failures. And I suspect he's going, and you go through all the things that's going to happen. And he says, but he's going to rule in my kingdom. And we, we follow it. We go, yeah, I get it. And that's kind of what he's doing here. He's saying, this is going to happen, but for, let me explain how, what's going to happen in the meantime. He says, but first, he must suffer many things and be rejected in his generation. And as it was in the days of Noah, interesting, so it will be also in the days of the Son of Man. Well, one of the things that happened in Noah was Enoch was not, for God took him. Noah also was taken in the ark and preserved to get through to the end to start over again, right? And who else was taken? The people in the flood. So there are a lot of takens here, right? But he says, here's an example. They ate, they drank, they married wives. They were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. Likewise, as it was also in the days of Lot. So he says, that's Noah's, right? The judgment came. He said, but Noah was protected. That's a type of Israel because we know God's typology is systematic. I mean, Enoch already was taken. Now Noah's preserved. He's taken. The people that are judged are taken. Likewise, also, uh, was also in the days of Lot. Well, what happened with Lot? He was taken out before the judgment came, right? And then the people in the judgment were taken, in a sense. Um, they ate, they drank, they bought, they sold, and they planted, and they built. They weren't looking for this to happen. They didn't even know it was going to take place. They, they didn't see it coming. But on the day that Lot went out, saw them, out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Even so, it will be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. In that day, he who is on the housetop and the, uh, his, and we saw this in Matthew already, his goods are in the house, let him not come down to take them away. And likewise, the one who is in the field, let him not turn back. And then he goes, just this one liner, remember Lot's wife? She had a salty kind of lady, you know. But, what happened was she turned and looked back to the world. And it's that image of her desiring the world rather 
in the future rather than what laid in front of her. And uh, uh, it, it cost her, literally. Uh, whoever seeks to save his life will lose it. And whoever loses his life will preserve it. And I believe that preserving I means spiritually in that sense too, being caught up to meet the Lord. I tell you, in that night, there will be two men uh, in one bed, and the one will be taken and the other will be left. Two women will be grinding together. The one will be taken, the other will be left. I think this, these are examples of, of both Noah and Lot and the people that are judged all wrapped up in the redeeming of words uh, of judgment happening and people being spared. Two men will be in the field. The one will be taken, the other left. And they answered and said to him, where, Lord? And so he said to them, wherever the body is, there would the eagles be gathered together. The same kind of concept. He says the evidence will prove the other. The evidence of the eagles will prove there's dead bodies. The evidence of the dead bodies look for the eagles. So in other words, one's going to prove the other. So what you have here is the recognition that uh, when all of this takes place, the judgment happens and the people that are there, you've got the people spared, Israel, 144,000, but you have Enoch taken out ahead of time. And you have Lot spared and Sodom taken out, literally, destroyed. So you have a picture of the rapture and you have a picture of tribulation, both of them here. Now in conclusion, uh, remember that 1 Thessalonians 5, 9, you're not appointed to wrath. Romans 5, 9, that, that wrath does not belong to you. He'll, t he'll take you, keep you from that wrath. And then in, in Corinthians, 1 Corinthians, oops, <coughs> excuse me. Let's see. 1 Corinthians 15. Here we go. In verse 50, Paul says this about this phenomenal event. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does corruption inherit incorruption. Now the kingdom of God dwells within us, but what we've inherited is, is eternal, and our flesh and blood isn't going to go with it. Jesus got a new body. He already shed his blood. Our blood will not go, and we get a new body. It's the same thing. Behold, I tell you a mystery. The mystery of this all is the relationship with, uh, with meeting Christ in the air. We see that in Thessalonians, because we know it's not a mystery three and a half years after tribulation from that day to the end when the second coming is. So this is about something else happening. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, which is what he talks about in Thessalonians. We shall not all die, but we shall all be changed. We have that sign in the nursery somewhere, I think. Uh, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, the trumpet, the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. It's a metamorphosis, like a caterpillar to a butterfly. For this corruptible must put on incorruption. This mortal must put on immortality. So, when this corruptible has put on incorruption and this mortal has put on immortality, and I think that's the two. The one, the corruption, is, um, is the body that died is now put on incorruption, and this mortal, the ones that are alive and remain, shall be caught up to meet the Lord in the air, shall put on immortality. And this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your sting? O Hades, where is your victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law, but thanks be to God who gives us the the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Praise God. So the, the, the picture that's given to us in the Old Testament, as well as the New, is that there is a time when God is going to take out, like he did Lot, take out, Enoch, God has not appointed us to wrath. He's going to take the church out 
and then he will have tribulation such as the world has never seen before uh, in the 70th week of Daniel, that seven year period will be poured out upon the whole world and Noah, the type of Israel there in the ark, the 144,000 are not Gentiles, they're from the tribes of Israel, shall preach the gospel. They are not gonna bring in the, go the end times though. It says angels will go throughout the world and make it happen. So we participate, but ultimately it all belongs to the Lord as far as the timing. So no one knows the day or the hour. If we did, knowing our humanity, we go, hey, I got another five days to party. So he says, no. You, and, and looking at tribulation, oh, I got three and a half years. No. That's going to be people that look around and realize the church is gone, judgment is happening, and the scripture is going to be very plain to them. Just like when Jesus was walking on the earth, they had to decide, is this the Messiah or isn't it? It's going to be like that for them. But we, the dead in Christ, shall rise first. Your family members, and if you die beforehand, you'll rise first. But those that are alive and remain shall be caught up, raptured, and meet the Lord in the air with those people, and therefore we shall always be with the Lord. We will celebrate in the Mary Supper of the Lamb, and then we will come back with him at the end of um, the tribulation period, which is called the second coming in victory, and then you go into the millennium, which is a whole other uh, Bible study. <laughs> but uh, I pray I've made it as clear as possible in the concise amount of time that we have but for you to know without a shadow of a doubt, if you believe in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and you have committed your life to him, you have confessed your sin and invited Christ to come into your life and you are saved, whether you feel like Lot or whether you feel like Enoch, the relationship with the Lord is based upon his shed blood for you. So therefore, live like the devil? No knowing the kingdom of God is within you, live serving the Lord so you can store up treasures in heaven that do not rust or fade away because one day he's coming for you. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your blessings upon our lives, for your calling upon our lives. And we pray even now for those that, that are here with us, that, that don't know you, have gone to church and everything else, but really don't know you personally. They, they might have a purpose in their life for, for doing things that are good, but they don't know you. Father, we pray that you just work by your spirit in their lives to make that commitment. Even now, God speak into your heart. Just pray, God, pray with me. God, forgive me for my sins. Jesus Christ, I, I just want to know you. Come into my life and save my soul. I want to serve you. I want to walk with you. And I look forward to the day when you will come for me. And Father, we pray for each one of us to just have a, a heart of obedience and a heart of expectancy, Lord of uh, your return, of your coming for us. In Jesus' name, amen.